Okay, so last time, last week, we looked at the account of Solomon. And we saw that Solomon in 1 Kings was given many things as a gift from God. He was given great wisdom. Wisdom beyond his years. He was given great riches. Riches beyond his natural abilities to accumulate such things. Look at all the numbers of that. He was given great political peace from his enemies. Where his enemies could not conquer and overcome him. And all this was done because of his father David. And the Lord said to him, as long as he continued to walk with him, that the same blessings upon David would come upon him and remain with him. Yet, and we looked and we compared the riches, the peace, and the wisdom given to Solomon, and we looked at and compared to the, the riches and wisdom and peace God gives to us. The peace that passes understanding. All the treasure of wisdom and knowledge found in Christ. Right? The wisdom we, can, we are given. The riches of all the fruit of the Spirit, of having our sins forgiven, of having eternal life. All these things God gives us and bestows upon us. And then we turn back to Solomon and saw how he, how he forsook it all. He forsook it all for foreign women who turned his heart away from the Lord and turned his heart toward idols, towards things that do not give riches, towards gods that give not wisdom and gods that give not peace. And he turned to all and forsook everything God had given to him. The one true and living God who gave him all things good, he forsook that for things that bless not, for things that only bring cursing in the end. He turned his heart away from the Lord, began to serve and worship and make offerings to idols. And so these things were all given to him by God, and now he chose to forsake him. We, we talked about how we don't want to be like Solomon. We don't want to be like him. We don't want to forsake God's ways and do things our ways and therefore forsake all of God's peace, wisdom, and riches and trade them for false peace, guilt, trade them for worldly wisdom, which is foolishness, and trade them for worldly riches, which is really poverty because moth and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal those things. And you can't take them with you. No matter how rich you get, you cannot take them with you. Those things are worthless compared to what God offers you. And don't let ever, let ever let anyone or anything turn you away from the Lord. Not your friends, quote unquote. Not your spouse, not your children, not work, not money, not stuff. Nothing. Let anything turn you away from the one who gives all these things to you. And today we're going to continue in 1 Kings. We're going to start in 1 Kings chapter 11 and verse 11. And we're going to look at the person who followed in Solomon's footsteps and what he did and then the man of God and what happened with him. So 1 Kings 11, starting in verse 11. Therefore the Lord said to Solomon, because you have done this, forsaken the Lord, and not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom away from you and give it to your servant. Now, when God tears something away, no matter how strong your grip is, you're not going to hold on to it. You understand? No matter how, how greatly, how greatly you desire to hold on to something, God says, nope, that's not yours anymore. No matter how strong you are. It's now God taking it away from you. Nevertheless, I will not do it in your days for the sake of your father David. I will tear it out of the hand of your son. However, I will not tear, it away, tear away the whole kingdom. I will give one tribe to your son for the sake of my servant David and for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen. Now see the, the little bit of blessing he still had to give to his son it was not because of Solomon. It was not because of Solomon's son. It was because of David. And his faithfulness. Do you see how your faithfulness to God can affect generations after you? Do you also see how your disobedience to God can affect generations after you? 
See, Samuel wasn't even going to feel the full weight of the judgment of God for his wickedness and rebellion to God. His son was going to feel it. You see? And not only that, his son was going to feel the blessings of the faithfulness of his grandfather, David. You see, so when you, when you are tempted to sin, saints, when you are tempted to do something you know you should not be doing, you need to think about this. It's not just about you and your pleasure. It's just about you and, and what you can get out of it. It's what it's going to cost your children and your children's children. And what kind of blessing comes upon your children and your children's children if you decide to be faithful or unfaithful to God. So keep that in your mind. Hopefully that will stay your hand from pursuing the thing you know you ought not to pursue. The thing God said, don't do that. Don't touch that. That doesn't belong to you. So we see the punishment once again that comes upon uh, Solomon and his son and the kingdom of Israel. Let's go to verse 26 now. And we'll begin to meet the man who God says, your servant, I will give these ten tribes to him. Then Solomon's servant, Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, an Ephraimite from Zerida, whose mother's name was Zeruah, a widow, also rebelled against the king. And this is what caused him to rebel against the king. Solomon had built the millow and repaired the damages to the city of David, his father. The, the man Jeroboam was a mighty man of valor. And Solomon, seeing that the young man was industrious, made him the officer over all the labor force of the house of Joseph. Now it happened at that time when Jeroboam went out of Jerusalem, that the prophet Ahijah, the Shilonite, met him on the way. And he had clothed himself with a new garment, and the two were alone in the field. And Ahijah took hold of the new garment that was on him and tore it into twelve pieces. Then he said to Jeroboam, Take for yourself ten pieces. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Behold, I will tear the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon and will give ten tribes to you. But he shall have one tribe for the sake of my servant David and for the sake of Jerusalem, the city of which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel. Because they have forsaken me and worshipped Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, Kamash, the god of the Moabites, and Milcom, the god of the people of Ammon have not walked in my ways to do what is right in my eyes and to keep my statutes and my judgments as did his father David. However, I will not take the whole kingdom out of his hand because I have made him ruler all the days of his life for the sake of my servant David whom I chose because he kept my commandments and my statutes. But I'll take the kingdom out of his son's hand and give it to you, ten tribes. And to this son I will give one tribe that my servant David may always have a lamp before me in Jerusalem, the city which I have chosen for myself to put my name there. So I will take you, and you shall reign over all your heart desires, and you shall be king over Israel. Then it shall be, if you heed all that I command you, walk in my ways, and do what is right in my sight, to keep my statutes and my commandments, as my servant David did, then I will be with you, and build for you an enduring house as I built for David and will give Israel to you. And I will afflict the descendants of David because of this, but not forever. Solomon therefore sought to kill Jeroboam. But Jeroboam arose and fled to Egypt to Shishak, the king of Egypt, and was in Egypt until the death of Solomon. So you have this man, Jeroboam, a young man, a mighty man of valor. He had lots of good skills and Solomon saw these things that gave him more power, more authority. And then a prophet enters in. And a prophet comes and fulfills the word of the Lord that he gave to Solomon. A prophet's involved in this. And so Ahijah says, I will give ten tribes to you, this is from the Lord, but only one tribe to uh, Solomon's son. Now what's the math there? How many tribes are there? How many pieces were there? There were twelve pieces, right? So how are we getting this math of ten and one? Well, if you look at any map uh, in the back of your Bible, most likely, they'll have the 12 tribes of Israel and their allotments. And you'll see the tribe of Judah to the south. And what it completely encompasses is the tribe of Simeon. It surrounds it all. It's completely landlocked, Simeon is, by the tribe of Judah all around. And then to the northeastern part of Judah, you see the tribe of Benjamin, very small portion. 
And so the, typically when you read the scripture, you'll see that Benjamin is really combined with Judah. And obviously some of Simeon, Simeon is, is, in, is inhabited by, by Judah as well. But then the tribe of Simeon, from what I understand, went to the north and found some other place to live. So really it was Benjamin and Judah and probably some Simeonites who became the one tribe of Judah. And the rest of the tribes were the northern tribes. That's kind of how it goes. But once again, we see that God will give ten tribes to Jeroboam. And once again, if God rips something out of your hand, it doesn't matter what you do, you ain't getting it back. You understand? So Solomon's attempt to, to kill Jeroboam was fruitless and vain because it wasn't going to work. God had already ordained that Jeroboam was going to take these things. And why? Because, once again, they have forsaken me and worship all these false gods. And who led him in that? Solomon did. He's in trouble for leading them in that way. So it's a punishment not only upon Solomon, the leadership, but also upon the ones he's leading. Because they have free will, too. You know, I can choose to lead my wife and my children to wickedness, and they can choose not to follow me. Right? God doesn't require them to follow me when I lead them in wickedness. But yet I'm accountable, and they're accountable if they follow me. See how that works? So it's important that if you're a leader over anything, that you understand the trembling, the responsibility, the accountability you had before God for the choices and decisions you make for those who are under you. You're going to give an account for those things. And now what was the promise that he gave to Jeroboam? Verse 37, once again, So I will take you, and you shall reign over all of your heart desires, and you shall be king over Israel, these ten tribes. Then it shall be, if you heed all that I command you, walk in my ways, and do what is right in my sight, to keep my statutes and my commandments, as my servant David did, then I will be with you, and build for you an enduring house, as I built for David, and will give Israel to you. Now the only thing that's dependent upon him right here is doing what? So bang God. He's not expecting Jeroboam and his own strength to build up his kingdom, right? He's not telling him that he needs to take over Judah to the south or to hold Judah off in the south and keep the north for himself. This is all God's doing. And all he needs to do is by simple childlike faith, obey God. That's what he calls him to do, to obey him. And if he will do that, he has several promises he gives to him. He doesn't have to worry about it, he have to be anxious about it, and take action in his own strength and his own wisdom to simply trust God. That's what God calls you to do, to trust Him. If God has put you someplace and called you to do a certain thing, to walk in that, to obey Him, to humbly by faith submit to whatever His leading is, and if you'll do that, He will bless you. He will take care of you. He'll bring to fruition all things He has for you. Because you're obeying him and having faith in his calling upon your life. Now Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, was, this is in chapter 12 now, was made king after his father Solomon died. I'm just give you a little synopsis here. The people asked him to lighten the load that his father had placed upon them. They came to him in humility, was, was asking for this. He sought advice from the, the elders of Israel, and they agreed, so yes, lighten the load of them, your father was harder than with all the work he gave them to do, all the building he had them doing. Lighten the load, and they will follow you. They will serve you. He said, you know what? I reject your counsel, elders. I go to the people who are like my peers, who were raised up with me. I'm going to get advice from them instead. And he said, if my father's work on you was like a pinky, was like a, was like a waist, my pinky's going to be bigger than his waist. I'm going to make it worse on you. And what did they do? They rejected him. So God used the stubbornness, the pride, the foolish, earthly wisdom of these young counselors, and he used that to rip the kingdom out of Rehoboam's hands. And this is when Jeroboam comes back into play. He comes back from Egypt. Remember, he went to Egypt to Shishak. He's coming back from Egypt. He hears what's going on. He's actually leading the people and, the, and giving this this lighter level of work on them, and he rejects it. Rehoboam rejects it. And then we see in verse 20 of chapter 12, this is where we pick up. Verse 20. Now it came to pass when all Israel heard that Jeroboam had come back, they sent for him and called him to the congregation 
and made him king over all Israel. You see the word of the Lord coming to pass right now. There is none who followed the house of David but the tribe of Judah only. Once again, it's including Benjamin and some of Simeon. And when Rehoboam came to Jerusalem, he assembled all the house of Judah with the tribe of Benjamin, 180,000 chosen men who were warriors, to fight against the house of Israel that he might restore the kingdom of Rehoboam to, this, to Rehoboam, the son of, king, of Solomon. But the word of God came to Shemaiah, the man of God, saying, Speak to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, king of Judah, to all the house of Judah and Benjamin, and say to the rest of the people, saying, Thus says the Lord God, You shall not go up, nor fight against your brethren, the children of Israel. Let every man return to his house, for this thing is from me. And amazingly, they obeyed. Therefore, they obeyed the word of the Lord and turned back according to the word of the Lord. So the kingdom was ripped out of his hands, his ten tribes. A, a, a prophet of God came and spoke these things to him, and he took heed unto it. And so we see all the words of God coming to pass. Once again, for, because of Solomon's disobedience, the ten tribes are ripped from Rehoboam's hands and given to Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, the servant of Solomon. Now let's see what Jeroboam's response is, starting in verse 25. Then Jeroboam built Shechem and the mountains of Ephraim and dwelt there. Also he went out from there and built Penuel. And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now the kingdom, this is where he gets off track, Now the kingdom may return to the house of David. If these people go up to offer sacrifices in the house of the Lord of Jerusalem, then the heart of this people will turn back to their Lord, Rehoboam, king of Judah. And they will kill me and go back to Rehoboam, king of Judah. Now let's compare what he just said to what God said in verse 37, 38 of chapter 11. Once again, So I will take you, and you shall reign over all your heart desires. You shall be king over Israel. Then it shall be, if you heed all that I command you, Walk in my ways and do what is right in my sight to keep my statutes and my commandments as my servant David. And then I will be with you and build for you an enduring house that I built for David and will give Israel to you. Do you see the difference? We have the wisdom of God, the word of God, who is, a, who is not a man that he should lie. And then we have the doubts, the anxiousness, the worrisomeness of a man. And what's he going to do next? What's he going to do next? Is he going to trust God now and do what God said and obey God? Or take things in his own hands and walk in his own wisdom and walk in his own strength and watch God depart from him as well? He knows why this was given to him. The, the, the prophet came to him. Ahijah came to him in chapter 11 and said, the reason why this is being given to you is because of what Solomon and this kingdom is doing. I wonder if he's going to learn his lesson. I want you to look upon the, the mistakes, the wrong choices, the wickedness of Solomon and the people under his rule, and going to do likewise or do opposite. Let's read starting in verse 28. Therefore, after all that worldly wisdom he thought about, all this wisdom, it wasn't from God, it wasn't based upon the word of God, this worldly wisdom he had in his mind, therefore, the king asked advice, and he got some bad advice. He made two calves of gold. Haven't we already been here? Haven't we already done this? And said to the people, is it too much? It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Really? It's too much to go up to Jerusalem? To obey God? Has God made it too hard for you to obey Him? Are the commandments of the God burdensome to you? Or is it a joy to you to obey God? Here are your gods, O Israel, which brought you up from the land of Egypt. That just sounds like a verbatim quote from somebody else in history. Who was it? Aaron. Let's just go, let's just go there for a second. Exodus chapter 32. Start in verse 1. Now when the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain, the people gathered together to Aaron and said to him, Come, make us gods. I mean, that just kind of defeats the purpose. I mean, if a god's a god, you don't make them. You know, if you make it, it's not a god. 
That's all there is to it. But so many people make so many things that make it their God. They make money, and it's their God. They buy possessions, and it's their God. They make inventions, it's their God. Right? They make things, and it becomes their God. Come make us gods that shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Forget about everything that Moses did, all the miracles done, all the part of the Red Sea. All, forget about all that. Let's just make some gods for ourselves and worship them. So all the people broke off their golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand. And he fashioned it with an engraving tool and made a molded calf. Then they said, This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. That's a lie. That's a bold-faced lie. They know that's wrong. But they're believing anyway. They're believing anyway. They're believing lies that they know are lies. They're not ignorant of these things. They don't really think that these two golden calves that Aaron just made brought them out of Egypt. No, those golden calves want to keep them in Egypt. They want to keep them in bondage to Egyptians. So when Aaron saw it, verse 5, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation that said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. Who gave him the authority to make a feast to the Lord? Determine what days are a feast to the Lord and what days are not. Who gave him that authority? Nobody. He's doing his own authority. Not on God's authority. Then they rose up early on the next day, offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. And the Lord said to Moses, Go, get down, for your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made themselves a molded calf and worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. And then down to verse 19. Let's see what Moses does with their quote-unquote gods. Verse 19. So it was, as soon as Moses came near the camp, that Moses saw the calf and the dancing. So Moses' anger became hot, and he cast the tablets out of his hands and broke them at the foot of the mountain. Then he took the calf which they had made and burned it in the fire and ground it to powder. And he scattered on the water and made the children of Israel drink it. Now, we all drink water every day. We drink other drinks every day. What happens to that water or that drink eventually? It comes out and becomes waste. He just turned their gods into waste. But they're worth. They're worth less than that. They were destroying their lives. And he's just see it like they are. It's like the people in Acts who took all their gods and all their books and were thousands of pieces of silver and just burned it in the fire. And anything that turns you away from a god, you ought to treat it like that. Burn it in the fire. It's not worth your soul. It's not worth your eternity to turn away from God and turn to things that save not and help not. So that's what we see happen before. Let's go back to 1 Kings now, chapter 12. Let's see what happens there. Verse 29. And Jeroboam set up one of the calves in Bethel, and the other he put in Dan. Dan is to the far north. Now this thing became a sin, for the people went to worship before the one as far as Dan. They're going, people are going way farther than Jerusalem would be, right? The first excuse to him making is, oh, it's too far for you to go. It's too hard for you to go to Jerusalem. That's too difficult for you. It's like people who, who want to make excuses why they don't go to church, right? Oh, it's too far away. We've had people who travel an hour and forth on this one way to be faithful to come to church. People make all oh, oh, I saw a drop of rain on the ground out there. I don't know. I think I can make it today. There's some traffic today. I don't, might get in a car accident. You know, I'm kind of feeling hungry. I don't know if I can wait through that two-hour sermon to, to eat lunch. You know, <coughs> oh, I'm sick today. I've been good. The last six days I've been good, but I'm sick today. You know. And so people make all kinds of excuses. Why? But they're going all the way to Dan now in the far north. Much further away from most of the tribes to go to Dan than to go to Jerusalem. It just, it just shows you how flimsy people's excuses are as to why they won't obey God. It sounds good at first. Yeah, it's kind of hard. 
You know, I don't have a donkey and a cart. All I got is my feet. I don't really have any good sandals either, so I don't know if I can make it to Jerusalem. But I'll go all the way to Dan. Yeah, I'll go all the way to Dan. I'll, I'll make a way. I'll figure it out. You see, so people, what people sacrifice for will tell you a lot about what they really love and what they really worship, what they make sacrifices for, and instead of making excuses. Verse 31, he made shrines in the high places and made priests from every class of people who were not of the sons of Levi. Once again, another sin. Who gave him the authority to make priests? To determine who's going to be a priest and who's not going to be a priest? Nobody. Verse 32, this sounds familiar. Jeroboam ordained a feast. Well, that's exactly what Aaron did. Not under the authority of God, who determines when the feasts are, but under his own autonomous authority. Listen, friends, we don't have the authority to make those kind of decisions for ourselves. You understand? That's why we need to submit to God, the omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent God who knows all, is everywhere, is more powerful. We need to submit our life to Him to make some decisions. To make all our decisions, really. I'm not talking about, do I get up today and brush my teeth, okay? Or do I go to the bathroom? I'm not talking about this kind of I'm talking about decisions for your life. We submit to Him because He is the one who's truly qualified to make these kinds of decisions. But we make our decisions ourselves, on our own authority, we're going to mess up our life. We're going to mess up our life. So make sure when you make decisions in your life, that it's not you literally making decisions. You're just obeying God. I'm just, well, God tells me this. I'm just going to submit to Him. So He's really the one making decisions. I'm just submitting to Him. Surrendering to His will for my life. If you don't do that, you're going to mess it up, man. You're going to mess it up. On the 15th day of the 8th month, like the feast that was in Judah, and offered sacrifices on the altar. So he did a Bethel, sacrificing to the cast that he had made. And at Bethel he installed the priests of the high place which he had made. So he made offerings on the altar which he had made at Bethel on the 15th day of the 8th month and the month which he had devised in his own heart. And he ordained a feast for the children of Israel and offered sacrifices on the altar and burned incense. And why does he do all this? Once again, why does he do all this? Because he's trying to prevent the people of Israel from going back to Rehoboam. But who took them away from him? God. And who told Jeroboam, if you do this, 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 and this, it'll be your kingdom and your people's kingdom forever. God said that. So instead of believing God and obeying God by faith, he turns aside to his own ways. Let's see what happens next. But you know what we'll never know? We'll never know. What could have happened to Jeroboam? What he could have been? How much he could have done for the Lord? If he simply would have obeyed by faith. That's it. So simple to refrain from doing it your way and do it God's way and see what God will make of your life and how you will destroy that if we do things your own way. But we'll never know what could have become of Jeroboam. We can only imagine in our mind. We know what God said, but specifically, literally, what would have happened to him? We have no idea. He had so much potential. Right. So much potential in life. And he wasted it on his own worldly wisdom. He wasted it. Don't let that be you. Don't waste your life. Every person here, Christian or not, right now, has so much potential if you'll simply submit to God and do what he tells you to do. So much potential. But that's the if, isn't it? That's why I was, on those, I was focusing on those words before. When we were, I was reading verse 30. If this, then this. But the if's a big if, man. That's the, most, that's the, most, that's the strongest two-letter word in all the Bible. If. Because it requires you to submit. You to surrender. Will you? Will you do what God says? Now let's see what happens next. See, even in the midst of all this wickedness, you know what we see over and over again? There's a word from the Lord. It's a word from the Lord. A hijah comes. Shemaiah comes. The man of God comes. There's a word from the Lord. See, God is trying out of His mercy, out of His patience, out of His kindness to reach people who are still in their sins. And He refused to do what He tells them to do. But even though they keep on doing that, He still reaches out to them. Do what I tell you to do. And if you'll change now, I'll give you mercy. Who else did that? David was righteous, a man after God's own heart. Then he committed the sin with Bathsheba. Was he a man after God's own heart where he's committing that sin? 
Why he's committing adultery? Why he's putting to death Uriah? Absolutely not. But you know what he did when he's confronted by Nathan? He repented. Psalm 51 is all about that. He repented. And then God used him. And God says all these things about him, all these wonderful things about that. He doesn't even talk about what he did was wrong. He's not bringing it up over and over again and beating him down with it. He forgave him. And he said, the reason why Solomon, you have this commitment is because you're your father David. The reason Rehoboam still has two, uh, one tribe is because of the father David. Keeps going back to that. But let's see what happens in chapter 13. And behold, a man of God. We don't even know his name. Just a man of God. Just a man of God. Don't have to know his name. Forget my name. Remember Jesus. A man of God went from Judah to Bethel by the word of the Lord. And Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incest to these golden calves that have not wisdom, have not riches, have not peace. Then the man of God cried out against the altar by the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus says the Lord. Behold, a child, Josiah by name, shall be born to the house of David. And on you he shall sacrifice the priests of the high places who burn incense on you. And men's bones shall be burned on you. And he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is a sign which the Lord has spoken. Surely the altar shall split apart, and the ashes on it shall be poured out. So it came to pass... When King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God, who cried out against the altar in Bethel, that he stretched out his hand from the altar, saying, Arrest him! Then his hand, which he stretched out toward him, withered, so he could not pull it back to himself. The altar also was split apart, and the ashes poured out from the altar, according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. Man, that's, that's some mercy right there. It's judgment, too. That's mercy. All he did was take his hand. I let the Lord take my hand any day before he takes my soul to hell. You can have my hand, Lord. Don't let me go to hell, though. You know? So God gives him a word from a man of God. And immediately, he rejects it. Immediately, he wants to put hands upon the man of God, the anointed of God. Touch not the anointed. That's the real. That's the real touch not the anointed right there. Isn't it? That's the real. You want to put a hand on my anointed? I'm going to shrivel your hand up. See, that's what happens when someone's anointed by God and they have a message from God and you want to put your hands on them and stop them because you can't stay in their message? God's going to stop you. And that's what happened to him. So this man went from the blessings, chapter 11, to walking in his own wisdom to now his hands all shriveled up. See, his sin's costing him his hand. But it's costing him. It's costing his pride, too, because he's calling upon him while he's offering uh, incest upon the altar. He's offering these sacrifices. His hand shrivels up. And this man, we don't even know his name. He's insignificant. He's so, so insignificant, we don't even have his name. He's the one who's going to make his hand shrivel up because of what he's doing against him. But the thing came to pass, like he said. We see the sign. And so we know about this man. Everybody knows about Josiah, right? King of Judah later on. This is 2 Kings chapter 23, I think. Much later on. So he's prophesying from this 100 years away or more. But it's come to come to pass. And how do we know it? Because we see the word of the Lord come to pass right here. Right here on the spot. Now, how does Jeroboam respond? You know, David, when Nathan came to him, taught him a little parable, caught him in his words, That's you! <sighs> he repents. Let's see how Jeroboam responds. And the king answered and said to the man of God, Please entreat the favor of the Lord your God and pray for me, that my hand may be restored to me. So the man of God entreated the Lord, and the king's hand was restored to him and became as before. It's good he humbled himself. And the king said to the man of God, Come home with me and refresh yourself, and I will give you a reward. So the man of God said to the king, If you were to give me half your house, I would not go in with you. Nor were to eat bread, nor drink water in this place. For it was, so it was commanded me by the word of the Lord, saying, You should not eat bread, nor drink water, nor return to the same way you came. So he went another way. He started to obey God. This man of God was so um, desiring to obey God, he wanted to do it to a T. He wasn't going to drink water. He wasn't going to eat. He wasn't going to go the same way back. He was obeying God to the T. God had given him specific directions. He did not return by the way he came to Bethel. But unfortunately, there's going to be some bad news for him. 
You see? Even a man of God. Even a man of God. Who God speaks to. And does mighty things. He can still turn back. He can stop following the Lord. And all it takes is one little thing. One little act of disobedience to just change your life forever. Let's see what happens next. Now an old prophet, this is verse 11, dwelt in Bethel. And his sons came and told him all the works that a man of God had done that day in Bethel. They also told their father the words which he had spoken to the king. And their father said to them, which way did he go? For his sons had seen which way the man of God went who came from Judah. Then he said to his sons, saddle the donkey for me. So they saddled the donkey for him, he and he rode on it, and went after the man of God, and found him sitting under an oak. Then he said to him, Are you the man of God who came from Judah? He said, I am. And he said to him, Come home with me and eat bread. He said, I could not return with you, nor go in with you. Neither could I eat bread, nor drink water with you in this place. For I have been told by the word of the Lord, You shall not eat bread, nor drink water there, nor return by the going the way you came. Now he's staying steadfast. He's not taking rest from this trip, not taking drink, not taking food. He's not even obeying what this prophet's telling him to do. He's a fellow prophet. I mean, he can go hang out with him a little bit, can't he? He's a fellow prophet. Verse 18. So the old prophet said to the young prophet, the man of God, I too am a prophet as you are. And the angel spoke to me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back with you to your house, that may eat bread and drink water. He was lying to him. When God gives you a word, you better not listen even to angels. You know, Paul talks about the gospel being preached by angels, a different gospel. Don't even listen to them. Muhammad didn't take heed of that, did he? Joseph Smith take heed of that? Look what happened to them. Millions of people being led astray, maybe even billions, by these wicked men who listened to angels who were not telling him the truth. So here we have a supposed prophet lying to him. Now, why does God allow this? It's a test. It's a test for him. He's had some tests already. He had some tests in, with, the, with the king. He had tests with this, this old prophet right here. But now the test is going further. Someone else is claiming to have a word from God that contrary, it's contrary to the word you already have. Now, if you already have a word from the Lord, and the Bible itself, or another word comes along as contrary to that word, what are you going to do? Are you going to hold fast to the word God gave you? Are you going to hold fast to the scriptures? Or are you going to do things your way? I'll tell you, it was probably a little more comfortable for him to sit down, relax, get a little drink, get a little food, get a little uh, company, a little fellowship with another prophet who's prophesied before, have some fellowship with him, but it was disastrous for him. And we don't know why he did this, whether he was just deceived or he just gave in eventually, he couldn't handle it any longer. But he gave in. Verse 19, so he went back with him and ate bread in his house and drank water. Now it happened, as I sat at the table, the word of the Lord came to the prophet who had brought him back. <laughs> this is an actual word from the Lord now. So you consider this guy kind of like Balaam. You know, Balaam was a wicked man, but God still prophesied through him. One of the greatest prophets there was was prophesied through Balaam. Right? So we have the same thing happen here. But what happened to Balaam then? He died. He was killed by the Israelites for his wickedness. Okay, verse 20. Now it happened as they sat at the table, the word of the Lord came to the prophet who had brought him back. And he cried out to the man of God who came from Judah, saying, Thus says the Lord, because you have disobeyed the word of the Lord, and have not kept the commandment which the Lord your God has commanded you, but you came back, ate bread and drank water in the place in which the Lord said to you, Eat no bread and drink no water. Your corpse shall not come to the tomb of your fathers. He's going to die for disobeying God. This man just got through preaching this sermon to the king of, of Israel, watching his hands show up, praying for him as restored, seeing a miracle happen, prophesying what's going to happen hundreds of years later. That's going to come to pass eventually. And now he's going to die. Because he's turned away from all of that. Turned away from obeying God and going his own way. And listening to lying words which are contrary to the word of God. Whether one spoken to him or the written word of God. He obeyed something contrary to it. It's going to cost him his life. 
Now, I don't know, it doesn't, doesn't really tell us if he has children or a wife, but imagine that. Imagine a man of God going someplace and giving a word to somebody, but not obeying God on the way back and losing it everything. His wife and children no longer have a husband or a father because of this. Verse 23. So it was, after he had eaten bread and after he had drunk, they saddled the donkey for him, the prophet whom he had brought back. When he was gone, a lion met him on the road and killed him. And his corpse was thrown down the road and the donkey stood by it. The lion also stood by the corpse. Now, how do we know it's a judgment from God? The lion, like I said, they just kill somebody and just, leave, just you know, hang out by him. Hang out by the donkey. Say, eat the donkey, eat the man. That lion's under control of God. It's a judgment of God. Obviously, a judgment of God. So we see the, the man of God going through all these things, all to be killed in the end, because he wouldn't obey God until the end. Until the end. Let's see what happens to Jeroboam, verse 33. After this event, Jeroboam did not turn from his evil way. He didn't do like David did with Nathan. But again, he made priests from every class of people for the high places. That's a sin. Whoever he wished, he consecrated him, and he became one of the priests of the high places. And this thing was the sin of the house of Jeroboam, so as to exterminate and destroy it from the face of the earth. Man. His, his, his whole line is going to be destroyed and exterminated from the face of the earth because of his sin. See what sin costs? Doesn't it make you want to never do it again? It's going to cost you everything. We're not even talking about eternity now. We're talking about just his life on earth and all his, all his descendants. All his lineage that comes from him. They're all going to be destroyed and exterminated from the earth because of his sin. And the way he's leading the people of Israel. But it didn't have to be that way for him. It could be much, much different. Don't become like Jeroboam and walk in your own wisdom and not walk by faith and obedience to God. If you walk in faith and obedience, God will bless you. More than you can ever imagine. You walk by your own wisdom, you lack faith, you'll be cursed. And then we have the man of God. A lot of you here are Christians. He was doing the work of God according to God's word unto him and he turned aside and it cost him everything. Don't let that be you. That can be you. You haven't done these things that he's done. Have you prophesied before? Things that going to happen hundreds of years later? Have you seen a man's hand show up and he starts out to reach you and, and grab a hold of you? He was a man of God. That's how he's known. If I, if I could just be known as the man of God, that'd be such a blessing to me. Put it on my tombstone. A man of God. Forget about my name, Kerrigan Skelly. Forget about that. Just put a man of God. That's what I am. That's what I want on my tombstone. That's a, that's a blessing to be called that. And yet he still turned aside. And walked in his own wisdom. And received lying words. as contrary to the words that God had already given him. Don't let that become you, friends. Do things God ways, God's way and, and the way God tells you to do it. And you'll see... Unlike Jeroboam, unlike the man of God, you'll see what God will do with your life. I don't know about you, but I, I don't want to see what, what Kerrigan's potential is outside of God. I want my full potential inside of the Lord, in Christ. I want a hundredfold, two hundred, three hundredfold, whatever he wants to give me. I don't want the scraps. I don't want to turn aside to the left or the right. I want everything he has for me. I pray you can say the same thing. I'm going to stop there for now, and I'm going to open up the floor for questions, objections, or things you want to add to the Word.
Mm -hmm. Because Warren was influenced by the third man, I think, in what he did. For sure. You know these people, you know? Yep. I mean, they might have wanted to kill him. Right. He wasn't going to do something like that, right? Right. So he compromised in order to appease them. So he stopped fearing God and he started fearing man. Yep. And Ray of Boom, you see the same thing. He says, or Jeroboam. Uh, yeah, Jeroboam. Yeah. Uh, Jeroboam, you see the same thing. That's that's a Ray of Boom, and, and uh, or I meant Jeroboam. Yeah. Not Rehoboam. Yeah. But uh, <coughs> Jeroboam, you see the same thing where he he thinks if if I don't do this, then he says it, then they're right. going to kill me. Right. That you know they're going to go back to you know to Ray of Boom, and then they're going to come kill me. Mm -hmm. And so he had a fear of man. Same thing. So mm -hmm. the fear of man is what the Bible says is a snare. That's right. So they both ran and Jeroboam, they both got ensnared by the fear of man. I think that's, that, that, that'll, obviously that's a lesson for us that that will cause us to do something deadly. Mm -hmm. you know, do something deadly for ourselves and for those around us. And let's imagine that, that, that what they're saying is true, that <laughs> if I don't do this, this will happen. Mm -hmm. Well, let it happen then. Right. Let it happen. Right. No, whatever it costs you to obey God, let it cost you that. Yeah. But in the end, they don't know that. Like you said, this is irrational fear. Yeah. They don't know what men are going to do them because God, God is their protection. We see what happened with the man of God. Shrivel his hand up. He tried to put a hand on him and shrivel it up right there in the spot. God could do that to all the people of Israel. Sure. God could do it to all the people of, of Israel under, under Jeroboam, but they didn't trust God. That's right. And, that, and you're, you're, you're right because they, they wouldn't have been able to kill Aaron. Right. And they wouldn't have been able to kill, kill Jeroboam. That's right. Because of God's word. Yeah. That's what God said. God chose Aaron, and God chose Jeroboam. That's right. He didn't choose them to kill him. That's right. So, but, but, but it shows you how, and we have to be careful, how the fear of man can cause you to lose all perspective. It can actually cause you to forget God's word. That's right. I mean, they, 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 they literally like, forgot God's word. Right. Like they forgot it. Mm -hmm. And they came under that. And that shows you how deadly that can be and you know I, I, I think that the enemy works with that to where he starts counseling you mm -hmm. you know the enemy you start coming under that and then the enemy starts counseling you mm -hmm. because who's, who's the one who designed the calf worship I don't think it's just men no it's the devil it's the devil <laughs> yeah the evil spirits designed the calf worship so once they came under the fear of man then that gave an open, open door for the enemy now to start counseling yeah, you can you can uh, come out. You, you can save yourself, but Jesus said, you know, if you seek to save your life, you're gonna lose it. That's right. You know, you can save yourself now. Just make this calf, and so you you the fear of man also can lead to receiving counsel from devils, and so that's scary. And and then I, I was thinking about what you said. You know how well we need to make this. Uh, this just this just struck me that 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 Jeroboam came under some counsel from the evil spirits because. Now he's like, okay, they're going to go back to Jerusalem, so we're going to worship in Dan. And, and what's so interesting about that is Dan is actually located at the, the base of Mount Hermon, mm -hmm. which is the highest occultic area in the land, mm -hmm. where there was demon worship and there was all kinds of occultic worship that had historically taken place in that region. Right. So they go and actually worship up there, where Jesus later takes his disciples to the gates of hell. Right, right. Right there. Gates of Hazel not prevail against yeah, yeah, exactly. So that's where they're worshiping. Yeah. So you know they came under counsel yeah. of the end. That's right. So that was interesting. It's so it's true, brother. People just forget the word of God, man. I mean, it's like sometimes it happens in temptation, too. You get tempted to do something wrong, and just like maybe you're memorizing some scripture, and you just forget about it. That's why you have to keep your mind meditating right. upon the word of God. Amen. So you have to be careful to do everything that's written in it. Like Joshua 1.8 says. That's true. You know, hide it in your heart that you may not sin against him. Amen. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if anyone's experienced that, but when there's been intense warfare, mm -hmm. sometimes it's hard to remember a verse. Yeah. I've had, I've yeah. just recently had that. Mm -hmm. I had to press, 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 press. I couldn't remember a certain verse. I was like, yeah. Lord, I was crying out to God. I remember, like, right. first I know this verse. Mm -hmm. And I had to press, 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 and it was like, so, yeah, that's, that's so true. And uh, to meditate on his word, and be ready, you know, gird up the loins of your mind for action. And uh, obviously, they stopped doing that. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, a lot of, a lot of uh, th this whole thing is filled with the fear of the Lord, right? Mm -hmm.
thank you for, for sharing this with us today. Amen. Uh, yeah. I'd like you know, to add to what he was saying. Um, the Shrine of Pan is mm-hmm. where right. we visited, and I wonder, yep. I, I would venture to wonder if that's where that calf was set up. Wouldn't surprise me one bit, yeah. bro. <laughs> yeah, it makes sense. You know, that's where it would be. Because that, that's, that's, you know, during Jesus' time, that was the center of that's right. worship right there. And I wonder if that was started with, that's a result of Jeroboam's sin. Yeah, you can go there now and see the, the different areas, and yeah. different archaeological areas where, where they had altars and things like that. Yeah. That, yep. that, right in that area. Yep. Yeah. yeah, right by the gates of Hades. Yeah. Yep. And panic is where it comes from, worship of Pan. Yeah. Seems like Jeroboam came under some panic. Irrational fear. Yeah. Right? And, uh, yeah. yeah. It's going to pan out okay. No way. perspective of um, you know what what someone you know what we can what we do can have an effect on like you know countless generations to come and like I think of uh, you know some 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 people kind of go to the other extreme where they say like because and I think it's the big the origination of you know the uh, what's it called original sin or something mm-hmm. like that it's like they say that because we, we take on somehow take on Adam's sin or something like that but I think it's like maybe like maybe they're like mis uh, taking it out of perspective where it yeah. says that you know um, thinking that you know it, what he did obviously caused or somehow caused us to you know to sin as well mm-hmm. it's obviously not true but I think it's like interesting like um, how you know there are some things that happened because of Adam's sin that have changed this world and it's it's a it's caused some you know some terrible things to happen and, yeah, it's, it's definitely real, some real. There was some definitely some real consequences that affected everyone. You know, That's right. in that regard, but yeah. obviously you don't, you don't take on the sin, but right, just exactly. That, you know, that has been a consequence, but you know, in, a, in the other light, there's a, you know, Jesus. There's a very real, you know, good consequence that happened for what he did, and that you know that caused many to come, you know, to become yeah. to life. Though the rat of many became sinners, but the yeah. Christ, Romans you know, five, bro. Yeah. Romans five. Yeah. 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 <laughs> that's really, really interesting, you know, like the influence. Yep. You know, what Amen, bro. That, that's, that's a good decision to make. We have the influence, and we have consequences. We don't have accountability for someone else's sin or being punished directly in eternity for their sin. So we do have consequences. I mean, it's, it happens all the time. The flood of Noah, that wasn't because of Adam and Eve. They started the chain of events, but it was everybody's sin. Every intent of the thought of man's heart was evil continually. How did it mean to make them do that? Did it on their own choice. That caused a flood. And what, what, what kind of world do we have now? We can have all kinds of speculation from creationists to say what the world was like before, before this, before the flood. Right? How much better it was. Why people lived so long. And we're suffering from the consequences of their decisions. It doesn't punish us forever in hell. We have our own choices to make. And we don't have to follow them that way. So we uh, you know, endure the, the greater destruction that's coming. That not by water, but by fire. Um, but it's still obviously some uh, some adverse effects of those things for sure. Yeah, I think that that in of itself is still like you know fearful, like just the type of effects that you could put on someone, like just you know like you could cause to someone, you know, just by not obeying the Lord, like the real effects that it could you know be to someone's like you know to their not you know not to their 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 gain, like to their detriment mm-hmm. in those ways. So. Yeah. So true, man. I can think back to my own life and think about all the decisions I could have made differently, how it would affect so many people. My children. I mean, if I would have married the first girl I was engaged to, none of them would have ever been born. You know? So, God is good to lead us and we have to trust Him and He has our best in mind. And uh, He won't leave us or forsake us if we stay with Him.